hereby call the Governance and Priorities Committee meeting for the City of Woodminster to order Monday, November 23rd, 2020. It is with sad duty to inform you that Ken Baker passed away earlier this morning. As we know, Ken was no stranger in this chamber around this council table for over 21 years in total. We take a moment of silence at the start of every council meeting to provide an opportunity to reflect on making good decisions. Today I would ask you to hold Ken and his family in their thoughts and your commitment as we take this moment off to you. All members of the council are obligated to declare a conflict of interest or a pecuniary interest as per section 133 of the Lloyd Minister Charter regarding any item on this agenda. This meeting is for discussion and information gathering only. All decisions will occur during regular council meetings. We thank all of our presenters at this time. Moving on to item number two, uh, the agenda. Yes, Your Worship, at this time I'd like to include um, um, item six on the matters. Thank you very much. I will look to counsel for direction on the amended agenda as amended agenda as presented. Council about the Thank you, Worship. I move that the amended agenda dated November 23rd, 2020 be approved. Thank you. I'll look for a second. Council Carson, thank you very much. Any further discussion before I call for the question? Not seeing any, all in favor? Opposed? Here. Moving on to item number three. Uh, looking for direction on the approval of the previous meeting minutes. That's about the question. Thank you, Worship. I move that the Governance and Priorities Committee minutes stated October 19th, 2020 be approved. Thank you. I'll look for a second. Councilor Franklin, thank you very much. Any further? Yeah, sorry, yeah. I just wanted to interrupt you um, just before we go to approval, there is just one item that I thought you know about here. Uh, it's just uh, in 5.3, uh, you know, generally when there's a declared pecuniary interest, you would mark it as such when someone's leaving the meeting. And I believe based on the way I declared uh, earlier, uh, when I left the meeting at 3.06, it was for a pecuniary interest because I kind of said, uh, if we discuss items related to specific projects, then I'd be stepping out. So I just wanted that noted in the minutes the same way it would be for Council of Buckingham. We'll make that adjustment. Thank you, City Clerk. Any other items before I call for the question? So I guess would uh, Council of Buckingham uh, move and amended? Move and amended. Yes, I would agree with that. Move the minutes as amended. Council Raymond, so we still seconds as amended uh, minutes. Thank you very much, Council. I'll call one more time. Any further comments before I call for the question? Not seeing any, all in favor? Opposed? Carried. Moving on to item number four, the next three reports. I'll look to the city manager. Good afternoon, Your Worship Council. For 4.1 2020 election completion report, I'll ask the city clerk to Doug Rob to present. Thank you, Your Worship, uh, Council. Uh, the matter before us is the 2020 election uh, completion report, and this is to provide the committee with an overview of the 2020 civic election. Uh, the 2020 civic election was held on May or Monday, November 9th, 2020, where electors could 
vote for city councilors and board trustees for the Lloyd Public School Division. The mayor and the board of trustees for the uh, Lloyd Catholic School Division were duly elected prior to the election as they were acclaimed. As the same number of candidates uh, were open for position to receive. Due to the climate weather um, the city experienced prior to the election, and the drive from the polling station was unfortunately canceled, and an alternate polling station was opened in City Hall. While unfortunately we were unable to hold the drive through polling station, it was the best decision to ensure the safety of voters, election staff, as well as to protect the vote tabulating machines. Election day ran smoothly without any issues at the polling station. The voter turnout was 3,035 uh, electors, 15% um, of eligible voters, with 22,752 votes being cast. This is the first civic election where the mail in ballot was provided to electors, 20 no mail in ballots were applied for and mailed out, with 20 being received by the deadline of the closing polls. The retainer officer has received uh, numerous positive messages since the election from candidates, election officials, and electors. All messages commented on the staff moving voters through in a timely manner to avoid lines, the sanitation and the health measures in place, and the ability and us providing curbside voting, providing special polls, the care facilities, and the overall level of service provided. Um, the objective is just to provide the committee with the details of the outcome of the 2020 election. Uh, the committee needs to accept this report as information. The committee requests further and more information. The alignment with the strategic plan is the better is in line with the following strategic area. Legislative compliance as, a legisl as per legislation, the municipal and the school elections to be held every four years. Um, and I will finally touch on the budget. Uh, 60000 was set aside from the 2020 operational budget to hold the election, which was set before the city and was aware of the additional amount, which was set before the city was aware of the additional measures that would be required due to COVID 19. The estimated total cost of the election was approximately. $74,500. The Westminster Public School Division shares the cost to hold the election with the city. The city's portion of the expenses for the election will come in within $60,000 budget. And all of that is the uh, expenses that have occurred. I pass it back to you, Your Worship. Thank you very much, Sid. Questions or comments for the administration? No, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what, uh, what were some of the benefits, or what do you see moving forward that, you, that we, the city could improve on for getting more voter turnout? Well, um, unfortunately, with the cancellation of the drive through poll, I think that uh, a lot of people were looking for that opportunity. Had we had the October 26th date, we would have been, been able to move forward with that. So um, moving forward in four years, that definitely uh, will be something that we'll be looking at to, um, once again, uh, run through and do. Um, I think, um, unfortunately, uh, the COVID did impact the uh, number of people that were willing to come through to, uh, to voting. We did have opportunities for um, mail-in ballots. We did curbside voting for people who couldn't get in. And we did special ballots. So um, once again, hopefully in four years, we're not in the same difficult circumstances we are, and we can, um, we can build upon that. Thank you, Your Worship. Yeah, I just you know, I want to say, even though it's kind of noted in your uh, in your report that you know you dealt with some accolades for how you for how the election team handled it, but you know, I really think it's important to note uh, I got so much so much feedback from people saying, "Yep, I was in and out, and it, they had everything set up. It was well timed, well placed, uh, lots of opportunities for advanced voting." Uh, so the adjustment to COVID and to winter, I think, made things you know really positive for a lot of people. Uh, who voted uh, early voting and things like that. So there's a lot working against us, I think, with COVID and with the U.S. election, Saskatchewan election happening this week before. So voter fatigue and political fatigue being a thing, not to mention the weather on the day out. Uh, so you know, with all things working against us, I think that you know, the, the city and the city clerk did a relatively you know, really good job for sort of what they were up against. Um, just from my perspective, as far as in four years as well, I think as a council, uh, it's incumbent upon us to, you know, really, to really push back against the provincial government if it comes up again where they'd like to push our election into November rather than it's normally around November. And whether we do that through at the municipalities of Saskatchewan level, you know, working with SARM, I just don't think that holding elections like this that deep into the winter is really 
appropriate, you know, given that we live in a snow-covered country that is cold half of the year. So if we can get some opportunity to get more in the fall, I think that it's really important that we push on that next time around. Thank you, Worship. Yeah, Councilor Torson touched on what I was going to talk about today. There was uh, some feedback received that uh, why did we bump the election back to November? And it wasn't the municipality that did that. It was a long discussion on multiple different fronts from the provincial level to try to separate the provincial election from the municipal. There were many dates thrown around, many ideas thrown around. And at the end of the day, the provincial government settled on that November 9th date. So like Councilor Torrison said, I think as we move forward, um, there's the potential that uh, this council may be a little shorter than four years uh, to the date, depending on what the provincial government does. They have a spring election and they say, you know what, we're going to move the municipal elections back to May. We know what's going to happen there, but hopefully we can uh, do that advocacy work and make sure that uh, the province is fully aware that the situation was not ideal to have a November uh, election. And we'll try to keep them away from the Saskatchewan provincial election. The voter fatigue and everything else council tours and talked about, I think, does play a factor. But I just wanted to make sure that it was, it was well known that it wasn't a municipal decision to move that election from the end of October to, to November. This was something that was mandated upon us. Thank you, Councilor Council Bradshaw. Thank you, Richard. I, I, I think the other thing worth asking the city clerk is that in the past, historically, have we had a lower turnout where, you know, the mayor is in my acclamation. This isn't anything against our, our current mayor. I'm very happy to be working with him again, but certainly in the past, I, I think the, there hasn't been as much hype around election uh, when, when the chair for mayor hasn't been up for election as well. That, that is correct. In 2012, there was a vote. Uh, 12% voter turnout. Um, so it was not, a, we didn't achieve a great deal more, but we were slightly higher. Um, once again, I, th I think that uh, there was a lot of things, as, as Council Thorson said, stacked against us with this election, um, the weather, the date, uh, those type of things. Um, I, I, I had some high hopes that we would have really been forced to our 2016 uh, members, which was around 6,000 uh, eligible voters uh, casting ballots. Um, but once again, that's, you know, as we move forward, we'll work with communications and we'll look at opportunities at our next election cycle to, uh, to engage voters and to get them yeah. And then further along that line, I mean, the Catholic School Board uh, was in my application as well. So every, every little bit of opportunity to vote and exercise your, uh, your, your capacity to vote is, is an influence, small, large, who knows, depending on, on the scenario and the issue. Correct. City Clerk, if uh, the Catholic School Board would have went to an election, would they have split the cost as the public school board and the city? Is that is it an arrangement as a percentage, or how does that work? So it would have been uh, one third for the, so one third of that would have been the public school board for the election, had the Catholic uh, School Board um, had an election, um, they also would have taken one third of the cost. Thank you. So was their share void at this point because they were, by uh, voted in the acclamation? Uh, the, the invoice that we forwarded to it was only for the um, advertising credits. Okay. At that point. So that portion of the election cost. Um, it would be unfair that I expect them to share the election costs since they did not have four yeah, hours. Makes sense. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Can I slow down? Thank you, Your Worship. So I just was wondering about the vote tabulating machines. Is that something we can use again, or is it um, like new every election? The, uh, the voting machines that we utilize, uh, we, um, we have uh, rented from uh, uh, the ECC, and I'm not sure the company name is exactly, but that's their business. Um, we did have previously some older machines that we felt um, were beyond life. Um, so we went forward and we had, uh, that's why we rented the, the machines for this one and we'll continue to do that practice and make um, the returns and the counting uh, much more accurate and much more quick, obviously. Well, I have lots of feedback from voters that they really like that system and they felt confident in it. So thank you very much for your work. Thank you, Councillor. I just wanted to again uh, mention that thank you to the city clerk and the team of the legislative services and our poll clerks and all the people that work they made it a, a great experience for voters. Uh, it was challenging, it was new, and uh, I certainly appreciate the efforts put in uh, from the work that they did on election day as they reshuffled from the uh, drive through poll, ensuring that as many voters had the opportunity to vote. Uh, every opportunity was 
addressed been done by city staff and uh, to ensure people had the opportunity to cast a ballot, and that's what the intention was to do. So thank you again to city staff for that. No further comments? We'll move on. Thank you, sir. No much for sitting here for that. Moving to 4.2, city manager. Thank you, Worship, for 4.2, development permit application use approval on a DC direct control district. I'll ask Anthony Andre for planning to come forward and present it. Good afternoon, Your Worship, and the Town Council. Good afternoon, Anthony. The purpose of this report is to provide the committee with information pertaining to development permit application received on November 6th. The application represents proposed change in use to allow the restaurant to operate at 7,003 44th Street, which is at uh, the cornerstone of commercial development. The property is located within a direct control DC3 district, which lists the use as permitted. However, under direct control, council approval is required. Should council authorize the development during a future regular council meeting, the applicant will be required to adhere to the regulations of the DC3 district, including but not limited to parking and signage. The department asks that the committee accept this report for information and that the item be brought forward to a future council meeting for a decision. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Any questions or comments? Anthony, parking, par <coughs> excuse me, parking is always a challenge even though because of the nature of where it's being proposed, parking is not a problem. There is no set of uh, areas that certain people can park for a certain business in that area, is there? Uh, not on street. All the parking would be uh, on site. On site. And yes. There's adequate parking. Right? Yes. So, as it's shown in the picture, but, uh, there's no designated area that people can't park in the so. No. Right. One more call, any more questions? Well, in the, uh, as the term has been used at the provincial level, we'll cut red tape. I'm hoping we see this at the next council meeting to encourage new business opportunity in our city. Thank you very much, Anthony. Thank you. Moving on to 4.3. Thank you, Worship, for 4.3, Fire Station 1, Construction Manager, Procurement Update, I'll ask James Rogers to come forward with the Good afternoon, Mayor Council. Can you hear me okay? Good afternoon, James. Yeah, yeah. I'll just take this moment, James, and just remind everyone to speak as loud as they can with these uh, masks on so that the public can hear us and as well as people as well. Chamber. Thank you very much, James. Please carry on. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor Council. Uh, before you is a uh, uh, information report associated with the fire station number one, construction manager procurement update. The topic is to provide the committee with an update associated with the fire station number one construction manager or CM procurement process and award. In an effort to maximize the budget and to promote a successful project, the administration opted to use a construction manager delivery method for the development of fire station number one. The CM method seeks to secure the services of a qualified contractor to provide pre-construction, construction, and post-construction services on behalf of the City of Lloydminster, whereby the CM will work with the project design team to ensure construction feasibility, cost certainty, and provide a collaborative approach to the design and construction of the proposed facility. As previously presented to Council, the CM method was selected as it provided significant benefits to all parties involved, as opposed to the traditional design bid build process, whereby the owner uses a good amount of project funds in the design phase before getting a firm price on the actual construction phase where the owner is potentially vulnerable to change orders, delays, and additional costs initiated by the contractor. The city issued a bid document to acquire the services of an experienced construction manager on October 14, 2020. The request for proposal package was issued and posted openly on the city's bids and tenders website. A pre-qualification process was not completed prior to the issuance of this RFP, and as such, all vendors were permitted to submit. The initial evaluation criteria and associated weighting identified within the RFP is summarized in the following table. Capacity and sufficiency of qualified staff, 
Proposed proposal team 14%, experience and corporate stability 24%, proposed work methodologies and proposed project approach both 6.5%, and then financial summary 35%, which is in accordance with our procurement purchasing policy. The proposal period closed on November 2nd, 2020, with 16 bids being received. The evaluation team consists of the city project team, ACI architects, as well as the procurement officer. A total of six individual evaluations of each submission was completed. All submissions were individually evaluated to ensure that an open, fair, accountable, and unbiased process was completed. The evaluation team unanimously agreed that all vendors who submitted proposals displayed a level of expertise in the field of providing construction management services with an equally impressive array of background projects and experience. All vendors who submitted understood the process and spoke in depth to the key principles of construction management. The evaluation team assessed each submission with the main goal of determining who the most qualified vendor would be to reviewing all aspects of construction management and not purely on project specific items or background. As an example, within the 24 points associated with the experience and corporate stability item, only three points were associated with fire station protective services projects as the overall experience and corporate background of the vendors associated with construction management were more important than specific building projects. Upon completion of the individual evaluation process, the scores from these six evaluators were combined and the total technical and overall scores were calculated. The overall score includes the aggregate, um, the aggregate of the technical score and the financial score. As previously indicated, the financial summary made up 35 of 100 available points. The financial score was based on the following four components. Fixed fee for pre-construction, percentage fee for construction and post-construction, cost of bonding, and then a formula for their labor rates. The breakdown of what was to be included in the fixed fee and percentage fee portions uh, was defined within the CCDC 5B agreement, which was attached within the RFP and further detailed within the addendums. All vendors acknowledge receipt of the four, vendors, four addendums. In accordance with the scores shown above, administration is recommending that Shandos Construction Limited be awarded the project due to having the highest overall score as well as the lowest overall fee. Through the RFP submission and evaluation processes, Shadows Construction displayed a high level of expertise and proven experience in the CM project delivery method. After the evaluations have been completed and the recommended vendor was determined, Shandos and the city project team reviewed their submission where Shandos continued to display an in-depth understanding of the project and the processes. Shadows acknowledged the complexities of the design and development of a site of this nature as they have been involved, involved in the development of a number of other fire stations using the CM project delivery method. During the discussion with Shandos, Shandos advocated that they will look to boost and promote local sub-trades uh, and local contractors uh, where possible. Although Shandos has industry partners and sub-trades from other municipalities whom they would have prior experience with, similar to all contractors from every municipality, Shandos sees value in using local sub-trades. Shandos provided preliminary insight on how they will look to boost local sub trade program interest and reduce program uh, procurement related challenges. One such example of this local subject sub trade collaboration is by holding a sub trade open house prior to issuing tender packages in an effort to review the design, the specifications, the bidding process, and the project specific requirements. By doing so, the hope is to bring all sub trades, local and non local, onto the same field. The procurement of all sub-trades, which includes scopes from the concrete foundation and site works to the electrical and finished carpentry. We'll follow the City of Lloydminster's procurement and purchasing policy requirements and will be available to all sub-trades on the City's bids and tenders website. It should be noted and stressed that this award to Shandos does not award sub-trade scopes to Shandos. 
evaluation team was overwhelmed in a positive sense with the number of submissions received, the overall capacity and quality within the market, and the positive background stories regarding the construction management delivery method. It was evident that the construction management delivery method will provide benefit to the City of Lloydminster as it actively seeks to dismantle traditional combative barriers between the owner, the designer, and the constructor. Through a more collaborative approach, of note, the City of Lloydminster Operations Centre was successfully completed using a construction management delivery method. With that, I'll turn it back over to Mary Council for any questions or comments you may have. Thank, Thank you very much, James. That's quite good. Thank you, Your Worship. I wondered if you could dive in a little bit. I'm not sure what your limitations are in getting into this type of thing, but you know, we see all these lists of, of, uh, of bids for things, whether it's this project or any other. And it always strikes me the difference between how in a project like this can you have three and four hundred thousand dollar differentials in bid tenders on something like this? Uh, excellent question. Uh, thank you for that, Councillor Buckman. Uh, with all procurement processes, uh, this is going to be my speculation on it. Um, we can have a construction tender where all the specifications are the same. They're installing the same pipe at the same depth to the same design, yet we still see large fluctuations even in those programs. Now if we get to a construction management delivery method, it's how that vendor has streamlined their processes. They can all complete construction management delivery methods or delivery projects, but it's their internal processes, their internal um, streamlining that helps them be more competitive or a little bit on the higher end of the price. Uh, that's just my speculation is what did they include, what didn't they include. Uh, we tried to narrow that down through using the 5B, CCBC 5B contract and our addendums. But I, I can't speak to why we have someone uh, near 700,000 and then the other at uh, 161,000. So I hope that answers your question, Councilor. Yeah, it's, it's just interesting if I'm going to buy something for myself and I don't know, am I getting what I paid for, right? And when we see three and four hundred thousand dollar price differentials on a bid, um, flags are thrown for me a little bit when it comes to that. And I'm just looking for some kind of clarification on it because it's not, to me, it wasn't just a little flag. This is like, wow, this is probably the biggest differential in any bid tender I've seen. Of course. Thank you, Worship. So, I'm far from an expert on this subject, um, so bear with me uh, to a certain extent, but it's just, um, it, it's similar to the fee question, um, but I understand why pre-construction services would be fixed fee in this scenario, like it, it makes sense, but I just struggle with uh, the actual percentage fee for construction estimates, because we don't have design to done on this. Like, we have high-level design, but we don't have detailed design to done on this, correct? So how do we make it so that all bids are equivalent in terms of what the service is being provided for the construction when we don't have a design done yet? A fantastic question, Councillor Forsen. So um, the fixed fee portion or the, the upfront fee, that, that is a very defined scope. And that is to help us, uh, help inform our design on cost certainty, uh, construction feasibility, um, market availability for products, um, and, and really it, it bridges the gap between our project team and the designer. When we get into the percentage fee, that fee, as clearly defined within the 5B contract, is for office personnel. There's your uh, project manager, your estimator, and other office personnel, and that is uh, calculated on our total cost of construction. Now our cost of construction has us paving the parking lot, doing the foundations, but also as part of cost of construction, we have site trailers. Uh, we have to have washrooms on site. We have to have a bobcat on site, garbage pickup, uh, and the list is, is quite lengthy as to what the cost of work is. So the percentage fee is there, what they can do in their office, or their markup, I guess we could say, um, on top of the cost of construction. 
Now across all vendors, we are going to have what's called general requirements. That's the trailers, the bob cap rentals, and that's going to be consistent across all of them. Perfect. And we review those across. Is it equivalent for personnel on site during construction as well? Personnel on site are defined within their cost of work. Okay. So each uh, each vendor will have general requirement costs on top of building the uh, building the facility. Right. I hope that answers your no, question. Yeah, because at the end of the day, we want to know that uh, you know there's a significant gap in terms of cost and price. Um, to me, I want to know that we're going to get equivalent level of service that's going to get that's going to maximize value of the project, um, and then also that there's some level of certainty that there's not going to be significant scope change because it's not designed yet. So how do they actually know how much their fee is going to be necessarily? So I don't want to run into a scenario where uh, basically the the winning bids. Uh, they bid 160, let's say, because they were aggressive in how they did this, but they know the design's not done, so they can bid whatever number they want and eventually get to that 450 number because that's what it actually costs to do it. And so, and that's as, year. As, as part of that process, the construction management process allows us to review down to you know, every nut and bolt that goes into this as well as trailers on site, number of washrooms on site, the boss cap rentals, that would be paid back to, or a reimbursable cost to our construction manager. So they might come to us and say, we want four um, work trailers on site. At the estimate time before they purchase or rent the trailers, we will say, we don't think you need four, you need one. You know, explain why you need four, and that's where we build in our cost certainty for the cost of construction. I hope that brings some clarity to you. At the end of the day, the entire thing makes me a little nervous just because of the trust. You know, I'm trusting that our team has gone through and vetted uh, carefully the equivalency of all bids and that it's meeting the standards that the city needs to be able to complete the project appropriately and on time on budget. And I just would feel sick if there is a significant scope change because the design is not done yet where they have the ability to change the scope to an extent where they're recovering a whole bunch more fees than kind of what we thought we were agreeing to. Now just, just so Council's aware, once they go through the sort of design of the construction manager they get to the point where they're for the budget, that's the budget that we bring forward and that's what we will expect the cost for that. Okay, so there will be that certainty in the budget at that point. And that's where council can choose that or proceed with or not to proceed with that. Thank you, Councilor. Thanks, Mr. And I, I hear where Council Carson is going. Is, is, a, is there a way of doing a, an end around or a loophole in the bid process? That's kind of what I'm seeing suggested. And, and so the question that I have is that one, everybody who bid here had the same papers and the same information at the outset. So if anybody was going to play a game, they all could play the game. I guess is the response I would have around that. Uh, and in the end, I mean, the, the budget relative to us is relative, it's significantly fixed or somewhat fixed relative to what you know we anticipate the cost is based on the estimate that that you put together and that we've uh, I guess approved in our capital budget as well. So I, I guess the tails in the final uh, balance sheet when we, we see the project being delivered. Uh, because I mean, I think you know we've, we've had suggestions that well, it's a game you can play it this way or that way. Uh, the reality is everybody has the same information, and based on the names on this list that we have, this isn't their first rodeo and first bid. So if, if you know they're planning on doing something sort of untoward or they're finding a loophole, I'm sure that of 16 bids, at least 14 or 15 of them have probably looked at this in some way that they could have an advantage of it. Uh, but it also could. James, you, excuse me, you alluded to at the beginning, uh, the city has used construction management on the project in the past, the city operations center. Um, now, I think the next major project the city's completed in the last number of years would be the service sports center. Do you know what methodology was used to construct the service sports center? I, I unfortunately do not, uh, but I would. Okay, that's fair enough. Well, that's, that's fair enough. Uh, I wanted to just broach the 
we, we had 16 tenants, which is incredible compared to some of the other work we've been in the last little while. Smaller numbers by all means. You mentioned, James, that it was posted on the city's bid and tenders website. Did that also then get out to Saskatchewan and Alberta tenders, or do you know how far reaching our tender information was out past that to other associations, uh, like to the construction association of Saskatchewan and Alberta? Because these folks, a lot of them are located in either Saskatchewan or Alberta, but outside the city. Um, I'll have to confirm with the uh, with our procurement officer on the exact uh, name of the I guess, vendors that that would be posted on. I do know that uh, for posting it on our bids and tenders website gets our uh, Lloyd Minster Construction Association, which Lloyd Minster Construction Association, which also shares it with Alberta and Saskatchewan, and I believe Edmonton and Saskatoon. Um, their construction associations. And then from there, it, it continues to gain traction. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you alluded to the cost as 35%. We've seen over a number of tenders, the previous council, you know, I mean, for this council as our first bid to look at, but in the past, the councils have looked at various things. Is 35% basically the bottom of the list for uh, dollars and cents when we have a criteria? Uh, again, this may be more a uh, uh, officers. Uh, question but we've seen 45 percent i think we've seen it vary so just just want to make sure that people understand that it does adjust and there are times when we go 100 percent it just depends on the application or the type of work you get yeah exactly so uh i'm an engineer i don't deal with finances too a lot so i won't stick my foot in that five i will let them speak to that but you are correct we do have tenders where they are 100 percent on the financials and that would typically be our construction uh, projects, our water sewer replacement programs. If we did go with a design bid build phase uh, or process for this, that would also be on the financials as well. But given the construction management delivery method, we did go through the uh, 35 points of the 35% waiting for financial. Okay, thank you. You mentioned, and I appreciate you mentioning it, uh, some trade open house, and I'm sure that's good. Subcontractors because there's multiple people from concrete to plumbing to electrical to all the pieces, including actual carpenter work and, and uh, construction work. Uh, the bids, how will that bidding process work? Uh, who issues the bids? Is it the city? Is it Chandros? Where do they, how will they be handled? Uh, so Chandros will be preparing those tender packages, issuing those tender packages. And, and ultimately be managing those tender packages. Now we will work with them as, as our partner on this project that they must uh, follow our purchasing and procurement policy. Uh, we will have them posted on our bids and tenders website and we will mandate that all tenders are open within city facilities with city representatives at each of these openings. Um, but Shadows will be in the they will be the main proponent of preparing and uh, administering those packages. As the construction manager. As the, the construction manager. We chose to yeah. have that responsibility as part of that CCDC5, I think that's right. CCDC5, absolutely. You guys have done a lot of those. <laughs> okay, well, I think that, that kind of covers my questions. Uh, I, I did a little research uh, in several as you mentioned, fireballs were three points in the total of 100 points and allocated. A lot of companies are currently that are on this bid list on their websites are showing completing fireballs, including a uh, local contractor that's completed fireballs. So at, at most, there was the three points out of, a thou or out of 100 that was weighted to if you had any actual firehall construction experience to absolutely uh, constructing schools and libraries and all the other things that these companies work on. Their websites were very well prepared and showed us a, a broad selection as all construction companies are. Yeah. So, thank you very much, James. Thank you. Councillor Fagg. Thanks, Sir James. Uh, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine that's uh, out of not a local guy here and just just overall about this about this type of tender and things and. Uh, he was certainly uh, saying that that 161 is a little bit lean, you know, when you take it into account everything that's got to be done on that. So, are, are, are you saying that uh, that Chandro is not going to—that's that's the max that they're going to be able to make—is this 161,000 on that? 
no. they're, they're going to walk away at the at the end of the day. Uh, th this is uh, they're going to have have all their costs in there that uh, that are required on site uh, for their supervisors that type of thing. So uh, that's a, that's a great question. So if we look at the costs that uh, each promoter proponent submitted and, and shadows at one hundred sixty one thousand, that is uh, not what they are going to be paid to provide these services. None of these contractors are, are that's their final um, agreement that we're going to have with them. There is going to be items that are cost of work, and that would be their site superintendent being on site. His time on site and the cost incurred for him will be deemed part of the cost of construction, which will come back to council for approval of the overall cost of construction of fire station number one. But that would be similar uh, across all vendors who submitted. So this would be for fixed fee services, um, which we saw a range of zero dollars for fixed fee to eighty thousand uh, dollars, and then we will have our percentage fees on top of that, and that would be their office staff um, to manage our project. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, yeah you bet. So ACI as the architectural, what what, what role have they had so far in this? So ACI as our designer, yeah. they are they are still the ones in control of the architecture, the detailed design, including structural, mechanical, electrical. They are still the design proponent. Our construction managers only inform them. Um, let's not put a light there. Let's not put this beam here. You know, it is going to conflict with the door. Uh, the chair rail around this room that's going to be an extra financial touch. So, our, so ACI is still going to design and manage the project from our, on our behalf with respect to quality um, and, and then just overall project review where our construction manager will help procure the services and get the structure built. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bruce. Uh, two things, one just for clarity, uh, so it is, uh, as a project manager, yep, we're going to um, look over the tenders for subcontractors and the construction portion of this, um, and they will be vetting, uh, are they awarding them, or are they, are those pieces still to come back to council for um, final oversight, uh, the larger building you know, the big dirt works or the big um, construction yeah. of the building overall effort. Okay. So um, once council approves the overall project budget, then they wouldn't see those items come back to them. However, as James has said, um, the city would be informed so when um, the tender opens to their area, there would be a city representative there and they would overlook the tenders to ensure that the city got best value um, and best value is continued at that point. Yeah, just my, my second point, and I just want to finish up with that one first. Uh, so there is some, there obviously is some local oversight, some some staff of our own on in that process to review and ensure that uh, everything is looked after and the criteria are taken accordingly and that sort of stuff. Yeah, that's correct. Once the, uh, so the construction manager would be responsible for the, for the documents when they came, when those came back, at that point, um, as James said, they would have to follow our procurement uh, um, procedures. And then, um, we would draft, we are directing them to come to the city, or the city, um, I'm assuming the off center. I, I just received clarification from P2 as who has been through this process uh, a few times. They will make a recommendation. It will still come to the city for final approval and award of those, uh, of those groups, but they will be Yep. But not the council to the city. Correct. Just so council is aware of that when we say the city. Yep. Uh, and then just a second comment. Um, again, it's just back to that whole big discrepancy between the lowest and the highest dollar. Um, do you, do you, and I, I agree with uh, Councilor Dijon that everybody got the same information. So you know, if you 
want to play with it, you can. If you don't, uh, that's, that's your, your game. Um, but I, uh, is there, do you think there is some confusion on what was to be included or should have been included? And, and further to that, and I, again, it, it's, it is what it is, but do you go back to those that have uh, lost or have questions and you help know, to clarify for the next process? Absolutely. Um, uh, I believe it's part of the new West Trade Partnership or the Canadian Free Trade Partnership Trade Agreement. We do have to provide a debrief on all of these proposals. So once we have completed our award, we will be issuing letters to all vendors who submitted, uh, indicating which way we've gone. At that time, we will open it up to having debriefs with them, and at that time, we will. Uh, definitely opening the discussion up on where could we improve, was it clear enough, um, all those sorts of pieces, because if we aren't improving for the next one, um, what are we doing here? So, so we will have those discussions on what could make it better, more streamlined, clearer, all those sorts of pieces. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. So, Shadows gets the tender for this. To me, it's feasible that they could then come back and make a bid on, say, the framing of this themselves. As a, as a sub of themselves, part of their company could come back and bid on the framing portion of this, for example. I'll have to look into that one. That's a great question. I do not. I, I don't think that they're. <laughs> Their role in this project is purely construction management. Um, they will have some stuff on the site, but anything more than um, having like one or two trades in on site, that would all be subcontracted out. So they have people on site to do um, roughing work, but any any major component, whether it's uh, it is carpentry, it is the, it's the mill work, or electrical, is all subcontracted out. Yeah, cause my, my concern would be where those tenders come back to as the construction manager. So if all the tenders come back to Shandos and they've got a sub of, them, of themselves that could do some of the work, my concern would be that we would be there to have those sealed bids open at the same time to make sure that there's transparency and continuation of the, of the proper procedure for project as opposed to having those bids be emailed or sent to them that they can see ahead of time. Like for a construction management project, because we oversee this, I would want I would want that oversight. That that would come in. sure. If it was big sales, yeah. I don't I, I, I don't know what to say about that. I don't I don't see that would happen. I think I think what the council is saying is that they would like a process where I think they have one council process where um, rather than having email submissions, we're looking for actual um, so seal seal bids to be submitted. Um, so and that's entirely and we know that for the uh, operation center, um, uh, Leg Corp was the, 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 the construction manager there. So they would receive all the bits and then they would provide the city with a breakdown of what they received, um, with a recommendation. So they say we received three bits. Uh, those bits that they see, we're okay with it, and this is a, a company of good standing, we recommend this one. So, so there is a process we go through, so we can, we can add to that to ensure that that situation does not happen. Yeah, like we just, you know, we want to be as clear and concise as we possibly can to make sure the process is as fair and transparent as it possibly can be. And I'm not saying that it's not in place to do that right now. It's just something that we've never thought of. And, and importantly, you know, Councilor, that the city maintains and maintains complete oversight of the problem. Thank you. Thanks very much, Pete. Yeah, the, uh, you know, doing a little bit of research on the whole scenario on the tendering side of things, and uh, you know, on on this bidding, I think that uh, Councillor Buckingham has a good point, and I think that they do have that built in that somebody's going to be there to open up the tenders, as the city manager indicated in a uh, that. Uh, so I, I'm just uh, I'm just a little curious on they talk about bid shopping, and uh, it can be you know it, the, this process is very. Is very difficult, and uh, you know, and there, it's 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 
a problem across North America on, on tendering. And uh, so there's lots of different ways of looking at things. So it's, uh, uh, it's kind of like the used cars. There's all kinds of things that can, that can happen on that. So we just need to be able to uh, protect ourselves and protect our people and uh, make sure that, the, that, this, that this is going to be as fair as it possibly can. That's all we can ask. Any other comments? I was going to I, I really appreciate that comment because I think there's two parts to it. One is, you know, the process should be fair about more than equal for everybody who's in that uh, business of the, the game. Uh, and the second part is it's the coming upon us to get the best deal for the taxpayers and the community as well. Uh, and so as long as we're hitting those two and checking those two boxes, I think we're doing our job. So. Thanks for question. Last question? Any more? Thank you very much. Thanks, James. Um, you know, Your Worship and Council, one of the one of the questions of today is given the dollar value, um, this does not require coming back to council for a formal motion of approval uh, because it's under the two hundred thousand uh, dollar limit. Does council want this back in front for a council resolution or do you want to leave it for administration to sign off on it? Uh, right away? Good question, Comrade. Kind of like city manager. And since this area is not a vote, is there uh, a motion to opinion? So, I'm sure I'd like to make this our first membership of uh, the uh, GPC meeting. Council can uh, make a decision to send something back to the administration and be dealt with that way. Or to move it forward. So, those are the two decisions that Council can make in the GPC meeting. Okay. I also want to offer a comment on your membership. I I don't see any problem in And I, I think that it is. Uh, uh, it doesn't have to come to council, but I think we're, we're this far into it that it, you know, it would allow for also some extra, another week of uh, discussion out in the community, and uh, be happy to, if it's okay to wait a week, I think we would, uh, I would be okay with it coming to council again, but that's in my opinion. Option, option two. Yeah, that's of course. Uh, I was going to say something different, I think I heard that and made me think about it a little bit differently, but, you know, as long as, the administration is totally comfortable they've got all their T's crossed and all their I's dotted. I would say, you know, it, so long as the process is totally, you know, you're totally comfortable that you're all the way there, part of me is like, yes, it's within your approval, that's our normal process. However, the other side of me is this one is going to come with some air and some controversy, and I don't want to put that pressure on our administration this time. And it can become a council decision where the elected officials, so um, at the same time, we should be the ones who. Uh, who made that call in this case because I think that I think this is going to come with some controversy just based on where we are in the world and, and some of the you know thin local all those different things that come with it. So thank you. Is is the week going to impact the delivery of the project in a significant way? I, I, we haven't set the award date for the 30th of November. Um, recognizing that, however, um, in time we get that there's an advantage to that, but um, we have said that it would be rewarded at the end of the month. Is that correct? That's correct. So we already, we, in our construction schedule or our design schedule, we had November 30th in there, but as uh, I've alluded to, uh, a week now is, uh, is quite valuable. But. Any other comments? Sentences on that? I would expect to see it back on the council meeting agenda for the next four months, next month. We put her top of the list so that we can yeah. <laughs> Thank you, part of the day in on the yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much, James. Thanks for <coughs> answering the question. Thanks, you, James. Thank you. Nice. And thanks for bringing that forward to the manager. Yeah. Moving on to agenda item number uh, five, which is on the government's priorities. Uh, 5.1, I'll have this in mind. Thank you, Worship. 5.1 bylaw number 38 2020, domestic animal bylaw. I'll ask Glenn Elford to come forward. Good afternoon, Your Worship, and members of Council. Good afternoon, I'm uh, here before you with an information report for the proposed updated uh, uh, bylaw for domestic animal control in the city of Um In the review process, uh, the last bylaw was enacted in 2015. As part of the review process uh, and the experiences we've had with it over the last five years, we made just a few changes. <clears throat> to highlight the changes, uh, one of them was uh, 
removing licensing from the bylaw and requiring the dog or the cat to be identified through a tag, uh, similar to the one that I have here, with a telephone number on it, and a um, couple of changes in definitions, as well as um, changing the uh, dog uh, bite or dog attack provisions. Uh, the penalties were the same for a dog on dog attack as it was for a dog on a person attack. And we separated those feeling that attacks on persons were much more serious and they should be handled differently. That's uh, about the summation of uh, changes that we made. Uh, most of them other than the uh, licensing one were um, from our experience. The uh, licensing, we looked at a couple of different options. One was uh, possibly a third party to uh, extol why we would want licensing. The other, we looked at uh, other communities, um, one in particular, Spruce Road, that had gone to uh, the same dog identification, uh, having an active telephone number of the owner on a tag, um, to streamline the process and, and remove that additional cost to uh, the residents, as well as uh, serving the primary purpose of identifying the animal and getting it back to the owner, preferably without having it go into the impound less stress on the animal, less stress on the owner. And certainly more effective as far as returning the animal if we can locate the owner readily. So uh, with having said that, um, it's the recommendation that uh, the council, uh, the, the committee accept the report for information that we haven't brought forward to a future regular council meeting for decision. There is one financial impact I wanted to mention in this and that is that um, the SPCA collects license fees and that's part of uh, our agreement with them but they keep those fees. However, they are also required to purchase the tags, administer the program uh, and attempt to contact the uh, owners of animals that are in town. So uh, in one sense, there will be a reduction of, uh, of uh, funds that they get but on the other hand, it will uh, streamline their processes as well and saving the expenses of the tags and those kinds of things. Thank you, Your Worship. Just on the SPCA side of things, have we gotten any feedback from them as to whether or not um, as to whether or not that's a benefit to their organization? I understand that they're a separate not for profit, but When it nets out, are they, have they indicated whether they're further ahead or, or worse off? Um, and I say that mostly because uh, the SPCA is a organization that we need because we use them as our account. Now, if we remove the licensing fee opportunity for them, if they were making net benefit, what we're doing is we're essentially just saying, okay, we're going to pay for this out of tax dollars rather than the individuals who have the dog go missing who are paying more of a user fee type model. So I'm just curious whether or not they're further ahead or not in this scenario. Uh, I would attribute the licensing with our pound agreement, and we already have a contract with them for the pound agreement. Um, the, as far as the SPCA itself, I worked uh, with their executive director, um, Danica Bodnerchuk, uh, who just uh, started working for them a few months ago, and uh, we reviewed the bylaw together, the proposed bylaw, and uh, she indicated that while there was some funding loss in that sense, she did acknowledge that there would be less cost for staff and uh, the expenses of purchasing and, and tracking all of that. So uh, in the end, she said that she, would su that she supported the bylaw um, as we did proposed. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. It's, a, uh, it's quite a, a detailed bylaw when you get down to the nuts and bolts of, of all of this stuff. So I wanted to review a couple of things as this was the opportunity to do that, uh, not specific to that licensing and non-licensing portion of the bylaw. A couple of things that I was trying to get my head around to make sure I was clear on. Um, it's under 5.3, the, the first one. Uh, it says that no kennel shall be permitted. Now, are we talking about a dog home in someone's backyard, or are we talking about like a commercial kennel type premises on a private property? Because if you get further down into 7.1, uh, and uh, you're looking at things that 
say it must be kept in a closed structure. So there is a couple of, of things that kind of contradicted there, unless I'm misunderstanding it, they very well could be. The 5.3 is the first one. So I, if I can jump in, I believe that that panel refers to a more commercial uh, panel. Um, and we're looking to the uh, definition, I don't see a definition of panel, uh, perhaps that's where we can uh, add that in and uh, make sure that that's captured. Yeah, because I think there's some there's some room to, to question that particular definition to make sure that it's clear to anybody who's looking at the bylaw. So there was a 5.3. Um, that's absolutely, uh, that's a good observation. Uh, the kennel is a commercial operation, not a kennel in the meaning to keep your family kept in. Um, and um, I did discuss it with our uh, staff and planning with respect to the land. And it's, it's consistent with that in that they uh, will not allow the kennel um, operation to be in a residential district. Yeah. Well, I think just if somebody was searching the city bylaws, I think that definition you know, is an opportunity yeah. to define that a little clearer yeah. as we go forward. Um, 5.10 and 5.11. I just wanted to say my piece on that as much as, as I can. Whose discretion? Does 5.10 and 5.11 fall under as far as what is excessive? Because I know that there are complaints that have been made uh, for next to nothing because somebody else has a pet lover on one side or the other. Uh, so whose discretion is excessive defined by? Well, that would be up to the judge. Um, the, uh, what our current process is under this bylaw is we have a, a barking dog package or a noise disturbance package. We ask that they fill it out for five to seven days with what's going on, their observations, how it's disturbing them. It's quite a detailed uh, event. If, if we try through uh, education and uh, trying to gain compliance, uh, you know, something as simple as leaving the dog out uh, in an open area at night or bringing it in. Uh, or putting it in a, a kennel in the garage versus uh, tied up outside. Um, those are the things that we try and educate first and make sure that they're aware that there's uh, an issue with your neighbor. And if, if not, and we have somebody that's willing to come to court uh, saying that this is an ongoing issue and it hasn't resolved itself at that level, then ultimately it's up to the judge to decide if it's uh, that kind of disturbance that has obviously annoyed uh, and that's what I wanted to flush out because there, you just told me something I didn't know, but I'm glad to know now. <clears throat> is that if a neighbor phones to me and says, your dog is barking excessively, you're not being thrown to the wolves, for lack of a better term, uh, tomorrow. There's a process that goes along with defining that complaint. It's not just a one and done thing. It's you're, you're telling me that they have to, they say, here's your sheet. Uh, please chart this over the next five days to tell us what's going on. And that I didn't know. Yes. And that's and that's the the fail safe for lack of a better term that I was looking for in that is that it can't be just a dog bark once outside and I'm gonna call the city and complain. Yes. So Absolutely. The public has to be engaged. Uh, the person who's disturbed has to be engaged. Uh, we cannot have a peace officer sitting there for the use to gauge when that's happening. So ultimately if the resident is disturbed, we have that process we have to follow to take it should we need to go to court. Um, by all means, we will go uh, talk to the person that's called and then talk to the person who owns the animal and make sure that they're aware of the bylaw provisions and that there, there has been a complaint about the disturbance. So that the pet owner would be informed of this five-day process previous to the five days? They will, they will know that there's been a complaint. Um, you know, ultimately what we're trying to do is modify behavior um, and, and that's basically the behavior of the owner, if the complaint is justified, to try and take measures to keep their dog from being uh, excessively loud. And that's, and that's good. We're, we're trying to be proactive. We're not creating a bylaw that's going to initially, I hate to use the word criminalize the dog owner, but that's what I'm getting at here, is that there's going to be a, a problem with that right off the bat. There is some provision for uh, awareness for the complainant and the person that they are complaining about and a process to go through. So it's not the city coming down and saying, we're going to enact this bylaw on you like that. Yes, absolutely. I can, I can tell you that under no circumstances when one of our peace officers, upon receiving a complaint, will immediately and ticket somebody for a dog parking. 
And that's that's what I wanted to flush out through the process. I think that's I think I've got something that I mean I learned something today that I didn't know. And I think it's very very common that most people wouldn't have understood that previous to this either. So thanks for explaining that. I can go back to the things that I just Thanks, Your Worship. So, pigeons, rabbits, dogs, and cats are in there. So, there's two questions around that. One is around uh, the potential for uh, unleashed animals, and I think that might occur in another bylaw. Uh, and the other one is that I've talked to people and they've, I've heard chickens and bees. So, would they fall, chickens and bees fall under this bylaw? Uh, I have also heard that chickens and bees. Uh, also so, that's birds and the bees, I guess, in a different form, I feel like. <laughs> Didn't realize they'd be in this bylaw, but here we are. There, uh, we, we do have chickens in here. They're defined as livestock. Uh, no livestock within the city other than certain circumstances, either by permit from the city manager or uh, through uh, the uh, exhibition association, circuses, parades, that, that type of uh, nature of uh, animals or livestock. Um, as far as the, the bees go, there is provincial legislation that controls beehive keeping. And again, we've had people inquire about it. Nobody has asked to do it uh, at this point. Um, and when we explain the, the reason it's not covered in there and that there is provincial legislation with respect to beekeeping, uh, it's about a, a safety measure. You may have somebody that's allergic to bees. If you start putting that into a residential area, uh, of course, uh, bees don't respect fences. Um, and so that it, it just it could create issues. Um, so we we decided that from an administration perspective to leave it to the provincial legislation and control of beehive keeping. Okay, thank you. Close door. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just have a few questions just as it relates to uh, potential annexation. So we talked about things like horses and uh, different things like that, and within our annexation plan we have. Uh, you know, the, the transition plan where there would be different rules applying in different areas. Uh, I didn't see it within this bylaw, um, but is it adjusted based on land use where you would be permitted to do things like ride a horse if you're still on what's agricultural land uh, that would be surrounding the city, including the annexation? In my discussions with the annexation team at planning, uh, is that um, there would be a transition. Uh, with respect to districting, I have not seen that as yet, and it is not covered in this. That may be something that we would have to bring back to council. Yeah, I, I just wonder, even though, like, even not just this, but there is still areas within the city uh, proper that are within our boundary where there is zoned agricultural or you know country residential, something like that. I, I think there's even a horse next to uh, the. Uh, husky on the north end, and so we're hanging out around there. So I just wonder if we need to maybe at least note um, where there are land uses within the city where an owner can do that within their own property. Because right now it implies that you wouldn't be able to do that unless you're part of a radio or a rodeo. Well, and I'm aware of places that have chickens at this point that are zone agriculture, but a part of the city. And you're saying the opposite? No, they they have chickens. Oh yeah. If someone has chickens within the city, it hasn't come to our attention yet. If there hasn't but if they're in the ag, and I know that when they, they pay their levies, or that they're, they're levied at a different rate because of the ag property and where we like that they are versus, you know, um, what we view residential or industrial. Yeah, definitely we can look into that, and then if there's a zoning exception, we can actually, you know, we're going to buy a lot and put some zoning for a zoning exception. There's no incentive to come back from the uh, annexation point to happen for the future of the companies. Also, the anticipated areas that could have been dealing with the matching in space. I don't think it's a big deal, but, but I think it, there are those exceptions. Yeah. And assuming they might be around the fact that, that once the city is expanded, there might be some grandfathering in or a period or whatever it is, uh, whether it's transition or otherwise. Yeah, I would suggest it probably be around zoning that way. Yeah. And so then it's changed from its agricultural use to a more urban, urban use, and that would, that would trigger the, the lack of ability to keep those animals. Yeah. That falls under the land use bylaw. Like having urban farms or like in, in livestock falls, those, those pieces are in the land use bylaw, is that correct? So the, 
the zoning for agricultural or those type of features would be under the land use bylaw, but you could put a trigger mechanism in the bylaw that says once it changes from agricultural back to an urban, um, urban use, then the ability to keep a chicken and pig horse or livestock nice. smoke be um, would cease to, uh, to exist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's actually kind of what my suggestion is, is that this bylaw appears as though it's being absolute over the entire city when we know that there are potentially exceptions that already exist and some that will be coming. At least just to specify that if there's some applicable uh, land use that's different where it may be appropriate to do some of those things that we're saying are prohibited. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, we'll, we'll reach out to uh, Sherwood Park. I'm sure that they deal with this. <laughs> transition from urban to agriculture and we'll probably have something like that in the office. Councillor Fagner. Yeah, I was just taking a look at, uh, I've had a couple incidences with service dogs and the definition of that and uh, anybody can go online and get a, get a certificate saying that they've got a service dog and uh, it's, it's been clamped down quite a bit on the airlines and that type of thing and I'm just wondering if, uh, if there's something that needs to be added into that definition of service dog. Um, just regarding with proper certification. Uh, I, I would believe that um, from a, a perspective of service dogs, most of your interactions when they enter private properties, so they're entering stores, that's going to be something that the store is going to have to decide for themselves whether or not that service animal meets their guidelines as they go onto that property. Uh, the service animal, when it's on public property, is no different than any other dog, really. There's not any special provisions for it in this file. That's right, that's right. Yeah, you can have them coming into City Hall, or you can have them in, you know, in, in municipal buildings, and as well as, you know, hospitals, medical clinics. So, uh, I, I know that some people will play that up. They, they use, the, use that certificate for getting them on airplanes and things, and in other places hotels and uh, so it's just uh, just a thought there I just was taking a look at it it, it can be some uh, can be a little troublesome sometimes uh, the other thing I just wanted to double check was that the, the tags that's just going to be a one-time purchase for the for the animal owner yes. okay. uh, I, I just brought a sample and it's as simple as uh, having your phone number put on I priced them out they're roughly eight dollars to ten dollars and um, that would be as, as, as long as the uh, phone number is operational. It still puts the onus on the owner of the animal to make sure that the telephone number that's associated to the animal that's on the tag is operational. Um, and again, I, I just I, I pride my team on a common sense application of the bylaws that they're uh, authorized to enforce as well. What I like about that is that uh, most people don't realize that the SPCA does get the proceeds of that. So when your dog's got that collar on, then it should remind them that they need to get their license annually and support the SPCA. Yes, absolutely. Councilor Wade. Thank you, Hubert. Um, I, I don't know if it was just me or if um, like when I look through a proposed bylaw, I don't know what I don't know, which was that would remove the licensing piece out of this. Um, and that's, that's fine and dandy, I suppose. I don't know pros and cons, and maybe that's what my question is, the pros and cons to removing licensing. And I assume we're losing a bunch of data because of that as well, too. Now, I don't know if we need that data. I don't know if that matters. I don't, you know, from, from here on in, without the licensing piece, uh, we're just, we are, and I, the same with licensing, we're leaving the onus on the pet owners to come in and, and license their pets. Um, same in this instance, for whatever, now is that we are just asking them to make sure that they have a tag on. Right, I'm, I'm correct in that, that process from before to now. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Okay. I, I do have the statistics from uh, 2019, and um, there was 207 dogs licensed and 57 cats from 2019. Um, and uh, most estimates say that's around. Uh, four to five percent of the actual number of animals in the city. Um, so there's there's a lack of data there to begin with because there's a very low compliance rate. We do issue fines with respect to not having a license when we impound an animal. Uh, however, that's that's a very small percentage because we're only impounding uh, 
a year to date, we've only impounded 129 animals. So, uh, although with their new executive director, there, there has been an increase in 2020 of uh, uptake in, in licenses. But from, at least from the animal control point of view, uh, our, our goal is to get those animals back to their owners as quickly as we can, avoiding the stress on the animal and the owner, as well as decreasing um, the demand on services for the SPCA. Councilor Thank you, Lord. Yeah, just have one more comment generally, and uh, you know, we've, we've talked about it before, and I didn't really think about it until now. Um, just as far as streamlining and cutting red tape, that it sounds like the getting rid of the licensing fee and going in this direction is kind of a reduction of red tape type activity as well, because it, it doesn't sound like it's providing significant benefit to half the structure that we have right now. Um, but this means that we let's cut out some of the middlemen and make it as quickly as possible. Thank you. I appreciate your comments, uh, uh, Councilor Torres, and that's one of the drivers behind this was to reduce red tape. I didn't mention it, um, but uh, ultimately it's also lowering the cost of uh, pet ownership uh, for, for the residents. Thank you, Glenn. We've got a couple questions here. Uh, going back to the local supplier of tanks, is there more than one local supplier that, uh, that owners will be able to access the multiple businesses, or is it? I think only one business today is able to provide these tags that you're proposing. There's multiple businesses that can provide them. Almost all of the pet shops will do this with engraving on site. Okay, perfect. That's great. I guess the, an important step for some, uh, I mean, 207 and 57 cats have been people that have been renewed. How do we propose to communicate this if this dialogue is approved? And then, because it, there's multiple players here. We've got the SPCA, certainly our pet stores play a very vital role in the animals as well as the city, so. Yeah, and we, we have communicated with the veterinarians as well as the SPCA. Um, the SPCA is, uh, is kind of the driver behind the licensing program. And um, so uh, we, we put them on notice that don't, don't buy the licenses for 2021 just yet. Um, they're not due until January, so uh, uh, it was uh, uh, our, our ambition to have this uh, through council uh, with any modifications that may be required and, and brought more to council to be approved. Um, but uh, again, if, uh, if that's the direction that, that the council wants to proceed or if they want to, to have licensing your name, we can certainly change that and bring it back to council. Fair enough. Uh, well, as we talk about uh, this bylaw, maybe I missed it, but I know we've been into this again from the past council. Uh, to replace the old bylaw. Is that worded in here or will there be two motions, two motions there's nothing saying that this bylaw we said is a previous bylaw? Does that mean here or is that important? No, we would have a very previous bylaw review of um, the reading of this bylaw. Okay, perfect. Uh, I just want to bring to you two a couple of items about that caught my eye. 7.9 and 7.10. Uh, and maybe this is the first one I've been having made. Uh, a victim of a dog bite once a long time ago. Uh, how do we determine why some dogs get two stripes and one and other dogs get one stripe? Because one stripe is too much in my opinion, but uh, that's just a personal opinion. But uh, we've given we got two stripes and one strike and who is the ultimate decider of allowing who makes which dog gets a maybe one strike versus two stripes? Uh, every dog bite file that circumstances of it. Uh, generally, a dog-on-dog -dog attack, um, we will uh, issue a ticket and uh, indicate that should there be another interaction with that animal uh, that, uh, of a negative nature, that they would probably uh, end up having a restricted. Uh, when it's a dog-on-person attack, invariably we go the, the restrictions immediately. And depending on the severity of the attack, we may use the provincial legislation, the Dangerous Dogs Act, and ask that the judge order that the animal be uh, euthanized. Okay, so it really falls into your realm uh, from that perspective? Yes, I, I review each one of those and um, uh, based on my experience and, and what the bylaw says, I go either with the restrictions for the Dangerous Dogs Act and, and provide that advice to my officers. 
Uh, I, went, I think it was brought up on 8.3 around the person shall keep livestock on the mill for purpose. I think there's a question about that and we'll move to page 32 to the definition of uh, livestock. And certainly there are, you alluded to the rodeo and other similar organizations, but I think you might want to just clarify that was brought up earlier about uh, chickens and other things just to be absolutely crystal clear for people that uh, you know want to see any chicken the association rise up in their city or something like that. Many other forms of livestock are used for hunting our guests in rodeo. And certainly in most cases are attended at the exhibition grounds where they're designed to be handled, but uh, not to be within the city limits. Does it, sorry, yes, Does it make sense to have a definition of what domestic animal is? That may be a very good idea. I'll look to the administration to either comment or take that one away. Domestic animals, so it's very cut and dry. I, uh, I, I think you need to be cautious for that because you could say domestic animals and animal that requires a name for its uh, for its care and uh, 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 we can once again uh, check out and see what's going on. It's just, if you say an animal that well, has a broad definition, then you're going to get a broad definition, you get exceptions to that broad definition, and you get the report. Okay. Appreciate that, Councilor. Yeah, it, it's, it's quasi related to this, but I mean, um, I spend not enough time walking in the park, but certainly my, my wife rides a bike and walks in there, but it's the exception when there's uh, the dogs are always on the leash, and they're typically not. Uh, and, and many of those dogs are allowed to defecate by their owners uh, and not pick up after them. And, and those are I mean, two issues that bother me intensely because children go through that area, summer and winter, and uh, dogs are allowed to do their business on the sidewalk, children walk through them, parents push their strollers through them, joggers jog on them, bikers bike through it, and eventually they find this way back with its bacteria and whatever else is in there, back to your home. Uh, when you find time to come up with a solution for that, that would be amazing. Uh, uh, we, we view Buck and Miller as, as the sort of the crown jewel, and yet we tend to have people in our community that view it way, way down the list, uh, further down the anatomy from the crime. Um, but I have a concern with that, because it's really disrespectful. And if, if there's anything new about that, would be great. I, I totally agree with you, uh, Councillor Dijek. There are many people that uh, disregard rules or feel the rules don't apply to them. And, um, and I agree, it is disrespectful to the, the wonderful facilities and amenities that we do have here. Uh, but if I can bring us back to 812, uh, that is the number of dogs or cats along to residents of combination thereof. Is that changed at all from the previous bylaw of 2015? No, um, it's still a combination of five animals, five uh, dogs or cats per residence. That's consistent with the bylaw from 2015, and um, that is, of course, excluding offspring up to six months. Okay. And again, as counselors to the former counselors of Dr. Dan's work, I learned something new every day. I did not know that. Uh, is that in alignment to other communities? If uh, someone asks, are we in alignment to a lot of other communities? Is five the number three? I'm not sure. It, it is literally a box of smarties when you look at animal control bylaws from one community to another. There are certain consistent items. Um, I have seen uh, the lower four, the uh, high ten. Uh, and again, depending on the type of community, rural municipalities tend not to regulate this in uh, direct control areas or uh, hamlets uh, compared to uh, urbans that tend to have a little bit more control on it because of the smaller um, uh, parcels of land. All right, the last question I have, is there any changes to the fees outside of the licensing fee uh, that's being proposed from 2015 on the fines, I guess, is an expected fee? The changes to the penalties, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the penalties with respect to a dog attack 
on a person versus another animal. Uh, the dog attack on the person was at $150, and uh, that's been increased to $500. And the dog attack on another animal, uh, I believe, remained the same. Again, the, the biggest uh, deterrent is when a dog is uh, declared a restricted animal or a vicious animal because the penalties are significantly higher and the restrictions are um, uh, certainly intended to provide public safety uh, from that animal. All right, thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? Thank you for bringing it forward. And, uh, we'll look forward to seeing a couple of adjustments on the other ones. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much. Thanks, Tony. I certainly appreciate the thorough review. <laughs> you can still see under that mask, but just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to 5.2, fire services. Amen. Thank you, Your Worship. For 5.2, fire service levels draft policy. We all have chief. Please see what you Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Good afternoon, Chief. Uh, would Mr. Fire Services is bringing forward to you a draft fire service level policy. Uh, this policy, or for this information report, is to provide the committee with the draft policy for fire service levels. Uh, at the April 23rd, 2020 regular council meeting, council approved motion number 93-2019, Fire Service Master Plan Comprehen Comprehensive Implementation Plan, uh, which identified several recommendations for efficiencies within the fire service. Fire Service Administration will be working to implement these recommendations with one being the creation of a fire service levels policy. It was identified in the Fire Service Master Plan, council recommendation number one, that consideration be given to approving the strategic priorities as set out in the fire master plan for the development and delivery of fire protection services within the city of Lloydminster. The city of Lloydminster will continue to prioritize the delivery of a comprehensive fire protection model that provides the most effective and efficient level of fire protection services with a focus on education, training, protection, and investigation services, resulting in the best value for the community. So I'm going to open this up to council for questions. Thank you, Worship. Thanks, Chief. So, uh, this fire service level uh, references NFPA 1720, mm -hmm. uh, which is the minimum standards for requirements. Um, it doesn't hold us to that at this point as, as creating this policy because there are a lot of things within that uh, policy that's pretty heavy, as are most NFPA standards. Yeah. Uh, this is giving us the ability to set up a scope because within that uh, 1720, it says the NHJ has the ability to alter as, as needed to the area of the county jurisdiction, which is us. So this is something that we're going to work towards, not lock us to today. He allows us to follow a standard, but not lock us into anything specific within that standard. Good, good thank you. Councilor Torson. Thank you, Your Worship. So some of the things that I, I like seeing in this is uh, identifying some of the items that were important within uh, the fire services master plan, like fire prevention and public education. I think those are critically important that we start identifying them as those that are something that we're providing that level of service and we're going to allocate resources accordingly so that we can start moving on doing some of those important tasks. Um, I did have a, a couple questions though, and, and one is, is pretty I don't know, maybe it's goofy because the fire master plan didn't specifically say anything about updating our bylaw. It says we had to have a policy, you know, we should have a policy in place supporting it. But I know from being on council that back in Q1 we were supposed to see a new updated fire bylaw, which this policy would therefore support. So is the draft that we're working on of the fire bylaw that this policy would support nearly done? And does it have kind of all these parts and pieces built into it? Just because Looking at it as a hierarchy of doc documents, the bylaw comes first, the policy comes second, as a support for that to get any details to it, but we haven't seen the bylaw yet. Right, so we currently do have a bylaw in place yeah. uh, that we are following. We are looking at updates to that current bylaw. Um, but this policy sets out the service level standards that what we can respond to and not respond to, basically. Right. So even within that, um, 
when we had Bill as consultant here, one of his comments was to me, uh, often because I felt like he was troubling me as to whether or not I even knew what our service level was. And say, so, so what, what happens, you know, what is your service level? What do you guys do in the case of an event? Uh, and, you know, I gave a very broad and vague answer. He's like, no, this is something that people need to know. Uh, his, his definition was, would grandma know or understand what level of service she's going if she has, has an incident? And for me, I don't know that this service level set out in this necessarily does that, because the two, the words that I remember from that master plan are, uh, fire suppression and limited extraction. And I don't necessarily, and it does say that, but it doesn't necessarily explicitly say, you know, there are scenarios where we will not provide service. So, like, for the most part, um, the NFPA 1720 that we're saying that we're following is, yes, we will have an initial response of four members and we will provide suppression unless we are going to a level where we're going to provide a higher level of service, which would require X number of members. And I thought that that's what this was trying to do. And I just feel as though maybe it's too high level. I understand why we wouldn't want to be so specific from what you said, but at the same time, I don't know that the service levels are necessarily clear enough as to what we're actually doing. Um. I'm trying to, so when we look at like section 5.1, uh, so it says 5.1.1 through 5.1.8, um, I think if we get too um, detailed in the level of service that we're providing, it could potentially put restrictions on how we respond to some of those incidents. That's why we try to keep this service level policy a little bit more broad than uh, something that we, we may put into the bylaw. So the bylaw would be more specific? Potentially could be more restrictive. I mean, I guess I, I'm trying to understand where um, the two high level, like fire suppression covers structure, ground cover, vehicle fires. But it does, does it say that we do interior or exterior? Because I thought that we could only do interior under specific circumstances. So in our I guess that's something that we could add into the policy that we are training to a specific level because we trained the NFPA uh, 1001 level 2 standard, which is interior and exterior firefighting capabilities. Can I just thank you for speaking quickly? Just for clarity, Councillor, are you looking for something along the lines of the fire department will respond with four members and the nine minutes to the residential fire percent of the time, which is which um, which is what 1720. You said a certain number of firefighters. That is the service level that I think that we are budgeting and saying that we'll do. So that's to me the important definition amongst all these things is what are we actually, what would you expect? Because providing fire uh, fire response or where this uh, just a long time we had it from conducting rescue operations. And, and some of those conducting fire suppression activities, it's not clear whether we're talking interior, exterior, and what that service level is. Um, because it needs to be defined. Because otherwise, you may, people may believe they're getting a higher level of service than what they're really receiving. So what we actually budget is our um, fire suppression for. So our bylaw does um, reference that we are trained to a specific standard which that NFPA 1001 standard does allow us to do interior and exterior firefighting in the bylaw. Um, I mean, I guess if it's something that you'd like to see in the policy, that's something we can go back and take a look at. I guess at the end of the day, I just want to make sure that we're hitting the points that that, that master plan was saying we were meant to be hitting. Because to me, <coughs> it's saying that we're doing a lot at a high level, but it's just the specifics of uh, what to me at the policy level rather than the bylaw level says that we should be doing. And, and maybe I'm not, maybe, maybe no one else sees it that way. I just, I just wonder if, if we need to be specific about what we're saying we will do within the 1720. And I get that there's factors that we prevent this. Yeah, yeah, so there are factors within, if, you know, if we say that we're going to meet that specific 1720 standard, there are limitations that from budgetary constraints and things like that. 
um, number of calls that we're responding to environmental conditions and, and multiple calls that we could be going to at one time could have <coughs> our ability to um, okay. meet all of that 1720 on a consistent basis. Yeah, I, I think I understand what the council is looking for. I think it's looking for us to maybe take some of the 1720 in specific areas where we're identified in the fire master plan and sort of expound on the whole of the services. Is that sort of yeah, what more so when the resident looks at it, they can see at a high level some of the things that that, um, that we provide. But is that kind of if that's how we get there, then absolutely. I think that is what I'm more or less looking for. Is saying, okay, uh, you guys have a budget of whatever, and that might be the only thing they see. But what do you guys do with that? Well, we provide this level of service with a caveat that there's several things that we get in the way of that that could not get us all the way there. But at least they know what standard we're operating at. And that to me is the service level. Not necessarily the act, all the activities included in it. Yeah, thanks for sure. I, I guess one of the things when I was looking at that section under 5.1, um, we had some tourism facilities that are, are throughout the city and, and some downtown. And uh, when they're leaning over, I think one of the discussions we had is, you know, when we look at the safety of some of these facilities, they are in many ways a hazard. And, I, and, we, and there were some discussions that happened where we landed on it, but certainly there was some discussion around the role, certainly, of, of firefighters and doing those inspections to make sure that if it was a fire hazard in our community, that um, you know, we would be equipped appropriately through your offices to be able to say to the owner, your building's a fire hazard, you deal with it, or else kind of thing. Where are we at around that? And this, should that fit under Section 5.1, or where would it fit? Yeah, that would sit under 5.1, and then we would have certain procedures within the fire department on how we um, would work towards uh, fire prevention activities within the city. Currently, right now, it's going to request a complaint for building a company fire officer protection okay. program, which would allow our on-ship crews to go over and do basic fire inspections. So, and then over and above that, we then come back to the assistant chief and myself to follow up on. So. They would be put in after, or they would they fit in any of these categories? They would fit in 5.1.1. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, if I can provide some more clarity on that. So uh, the fire bylaw gives the, uh, the authority of the fire chief to um, direct or order somebody to um, stop, change, or uh, yeah. prep, uh, prep an issue. The charter session plan, the plan, you want to give us authority to you know, the act on that behalf yeah. as well. So that would be the, the, uh, the legislative act. Um, I think here would be. So the tools are in essence there. The tools are in essence have, there. Have, so just yeah. another question, have we used them in the last 10 years at all? That's not mm -hmm. We have used them this year already okay. out of the bylaw okay. in certain aspects. Thank you. Chief, uh, going down that whole 5.1, that's what you've been determining and proposing what the city is expecting. Uh, and you mentioned it, uh, budgetary limitations, and it's, it's outlined in here uh, in the 5.2, but uh, Conducting rescue operations. Certainly, our fire department is equipped to do certain pieces of rescue because we know rescue is one of the lines we are going to get right. so more. So, is it, the intent is to do what we can do and work with other resources that are available to us. And we say the same 5.17. I'm not chatting about this to the city manager and medical first response assistance. I think it's very critical that we can offer it, and we just don't want to become the first line of defense. Right. It allows us to operate at that level within certain constraints, whether it's budgetary, number of calls, personnel, things like that. Good, because I think, I think uh, again, people have that expectation in the result of the comes of course. And what does our fire department provide? What does it provide by the fire service? Um, until you need them, you, you see them, and then when you really need them, you really need them. Mm -hmm. to make the various members around this council understand it very clearly. So, no, I think that answers that question. I think that's, uh, again, this is just a, an overarching document of the policy. It's not getting down into the weeds of saying this is what we do and this is what we're not doing. This is an overarching document that you're making. Councilor Murphy. Thank you, Worship. That kind of speaks to my point uh, that I'd like to make is do we need to money the waters by adding that stuff to the policy versus having it in the bylaw? One of the things that Council Torson was recommending to go into the policy piece. Add the addition to what you have, it's already in the Bible. Yes, or there are, are, are you know, standard operations 
standard operating procedures that we have within the fire services will respond to it and can and can't do within those those certain like if we're not trained to that specific level then we're not going to operate at that level yes and the bylaw itself is coming back to council for review shortly sometime um, sooner rather than later right <laughs> And so does it need to be defined in this policy to move the policy forward? Or do we leave it within the bylaw? I would leave it within the bylaw and leave this as an overarching. Yeah, that's kind of what I was getting at. It seemed like we were doubling, doubling up something that wasn't necessary. Right. To me, anyway. So, of course, thank you, Your Worship. I just think that that's an area we have it backwards as far as the one that broad strokes and the one that's specific. The one that's broad stroke should be the bylaw, and the one that gets that other level of details at the policy level. Where you set that very standard. Some of, some of these things that we operate at, though, are going to fall under our standing operating guidelines or procedures that we have within the department, not necessarily within the bylaw as well. So if we're doing technical rescue, it's not necessarily the bylaw, it's basically how we operate under our standard operating procedures or guidelines to operate at that event. So it's not necessarily a bylaw related issue as well when it comes to some of these service level um, policies. Yeah. And that's fine. It's just to me, it's, this is a document that we're communicating to the public in terms of this is what we do. So, so I understand the procedures would be great, are perfect for internal for that very specific, mm -hmm. um, but then at this level, I just think that in terms of bylaw versus uh, policy, I, I guess I would just disagree with Councilor Buckingham to a certain extent and that those two things are flipped. Yeah. Can I get some magic first? I think what we'll do as administration, we'll take those points into consideration and look at the three documents, the bylaw, the policy, and the, the operating procedures, or, and we'll make sure we have those by uh, the way we think they should be, and we'll bring that back to make sure we review that. So. I think they're, they're valid points and we can look at them and sure what we should be doing. I, I was just going to add, it, it, it really can vary. I don't think there's a general rule of thumb, but I think generally your policy is going to say, overall, here's what we're aspiring to do. Your bylaw then says, this is how we're going to hold ourselves accountable. We're going to do this, 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 and this, and this is how we're going to do it. And there's teeth in it relative to you know, making sure you do that. But it, it, it varies. And I mean, I, you know, there's, I think the extraneous circumstances here is a set of standards that exist outside the bylaws, which have an impact internally into the bylaws here. So we're playing with about three or four different pieces, and and I get it. You're trying to make clarity out of all those different bodies and rules, and that makes it difficult. See, the clerk, um, perhaps maybe we're we're trying the conversation in um, only maybe one piece. We have a fire bylaw that is extremely close to very maybe we will bring both these both these other things in the Any other comments? Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. There's lots to discuss today. Thank you. Certainly, sounds good. Chief, 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 don't go too far. Chief, wait, wait. Right, please, just one quick thing. Uh, I know you guys have been extremely busy this year related to COVID and all those other things, and not to mention the number of calls you've had. So I don't want to imply that this is a first work. Oh, no, no, no. I, I, I'm not taking it that way at all. So. <laughs> but we'll definitely follow up on the information that uh, that you're bringing forward. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Moving on to item number seven, sorry, six. Uh, other matters? I just wanted to take this time to uh, again express uh, our deepest condolences to the Baker family, to Jean, and uh, their immediate family and extended family. Councilor Baker has played a huge role in my life as the mayor, and uh, I can't say enough thank yous to him, which I've shared with him while he was with us. But I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to share any more uh, directly. But I just think that uh, I wanted to give Council the opportunity to uh, add anything they would like. I know there's Council members here that have worked with uh, Councilor over the last four years, prior to those four years, and, and Councilor Mary, I'm uh, not uh, having sat at the Council table with them, but had uh, worked with Councilor Baker as both Councilor and Mayor, and I just wanted to open it up so that people had the opportunity. It certainly uh, it was sudden, and uh, you know, the Councilor has uh, had some health issues that has been troubling him for some time, and uh, he's been called to the very reward. I just want to open the up at this time to the council members so much to speak. Councilor Buckner? 
we just uh, recently had the opportunity to, uh, as the election process went by, to um, reflect on it. It was a question that was asked of, of all the people that had served with Council Baker before. I, uh, you know, I said it then, I'll say it again. I've known Ken for over 20 years and worked with him in numerous different capacities in his roles and through my roles in the city. And, <coughs> I remember sitting with him at one of the first things that I think I was the chamber president and I was fairly young at the time and had the opportunity to, to go to a function with, uh, with Ken and Gene and remember feeling completely overshadowed by a man that I knew had already done so much for the community and that was in 2005. There's another 16 years ago uh, behind that for the things that, that he has done and, and brought to our community, and, um, especially uh, directly as a colleague over the last four years. To uh, be able to sit beside him and, uh, and lean on his expertise on so many different things. Um, I'm better for having known him, I'm better for having sat beside him. And I know as we go forward, there's going to be a lot of things that uh, I'll look back on and reference in the things that he taught me and, and worked alongside me on. We chatted just last week uh, about a few things, and I always loved how uh, appropriate, uh, inappropriately appropriate he was <laughs> yeah, in those conversations, candidly back and forth and I'll always remember him for it and the community owes Ken and his family a, a huge debt of gratitude for all the things he's done over this time. And you, you miss a lot of family time doing the things that he had and in talking to Ken's daughter this morning, she kind of summed it up best for me saying that he had a servant's heart and I think that's exactly the appropriate way to remember Ken and he did have that and with that comes a lot of hardships and a lot of a lot of time away from that family. And thank you wasn't enough from the community for Ken for what he has done. It's pretty much all the words you can you can muster right now is, is thank you for all you all you've done for us. But um, you know we'll all we'll all miss him a lot and, and uh, we'll try and carry on the legacy of the, of the work that he set forward as a as a founding father of our community. In the last 20 years, I don't know if founding father is the right word, but someone who was, through his stewardship, led this community through a long period of time. But I'm thankful for the opportunities I've had with him in the last 20 years. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Freeman. Yeah, I, uh, you know, certainly Ken was uh, a great leader uh, on the municipal side. He was a great leader in the community of his years in Kinsman and and just being involved in in many different things. And uh, he was, uh, yeah, had a huge impact on, on many people within the city, there's no question about it. And I guess, uh, you know, for myself, uh, I was very fortunate to have some, a lot of insight with him over the 20, 20 years or 25 years that I've known him. But uh, of course, the, the main thing with Ken and myself, he was always a great friend. And so, yeah, gonna miss the guy. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Tuncher. Thanks, Mr. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work with Ken going back many, many years and uh, start the drug strategy and, and uh, he kept saying, you come to see me for money and I kept saying, no, we need a strategy. He said, no, you need the money. I said, no, we need the strategy. He said, here's the money, now go make the strategy. <laughs> um, so Ken, Ken believed in our community and saw, we could see the needs was uh, quick to step up and, and find the funds and the actions to support those needs. And, and I think that speaks to a sense of uh, community being part of it and, and seeing the benefits not only for him and his family but everybody who was part of the city. Uh, his contribution of 21 years thereabouts, plus or I don't know what plus or minus what that is, but uh, in that time he's left a legacy. I know in Saskatchewan where we would be at SUMA, which is now Saskatchewan Municipalities, the Municipalities of Saskatchewan, I can't get it right, one of those two. Uh, people say, oh yeah, I can't hear saying hi to And so I mean people throughout Saskatchewan um, knew him and knew him well and, and spoke highly of him and uh, I know that you know again we we see the impact we have in our own community and what he's done. The reality is is that you know the power of one and that influence he had extended beyond the borders of the city and both provinces and, and many people uh, sought him out, looked to him and had conversations with him because he was just that kind of guy. Um, life is pretty fleeting. I just saw him a couple weeks back and I can still recall the conversation and he was one of the people that sort of convinced me in some way to, to run again. Uh, I think it was about after the second year at, in the 
this when I was counselor, he said, you're going to run again, aren't you? I said, no, not a chance. And uh, he said, no, you got to run, you got to run. I'm like, you got to get past this, right? Uh, so he was always encouraging, I think, all of us, again, to, to stay focused on what the prize was and, and working for our community in spite of all the challenges that we're up, we were up against. So uh, for that, I'm grateful. And I think, you know, he encouraged not only us, but many other people in the community in terms of what was out there. And uh, I think you'll always be remembered that way. Thanks, Richard. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Richard. So I only only knew Ken from the time that basically just before we were elected, he was one of the first people that I uh, spoke with when I mentioned some interest in it, and he gave me some really, really good advice at that time. But uh, I moved back to Lloydminster when I was a kid. I moved around a little bit to Grand Prairie and Saskatoon, and when I moved back to Lloydminster around 94, 95, was about the time that he got into municipal politics and. And um, when I think about it, you know, growing up in Lloydminster, getting that sense of nostalgia and the value of the services that you use in the city, whether that's the trails or, you know, the skate park guy and you know, it was his council that got the skate park brought in, which, you know, gave me the nostalgic memories that I have for the city that eventually, after I was done university, chose to come back to Lloydminster. And, and I think when we think about what we do on council, uh, you know, it, there's Sure, there's snow clearing and stuff like that, but it's, it's that other stuff that, that makes you love a place to live. And, uh, and, and people like Ken made Lloyd uh, that place for, for me, which eventually made this my home and, and eventually to the point where I want to do that for our own community. So, you know, I, I really value our relationship and, and the time that we have spent together. You know, his call to congratulate me on election day was probably the most meaningful one that I got, so, you know, I'm going to miss him, I learned a lot from him, we didn't always agree, but we like to pick on each other, and, and that's just the way it was, so, um, disappointing that we won't have him to call and bounce things off of anymore, but yeah, I guess it is what it is. Thank you. Thanks, Russell. Russell Berry. Thank you, Your Worship. So I didn't have the privilege of working with Ken around this table, um, but I am grateful that all of you did, and and so I worked with him on many things in the community over the years. And I think sometimes Ken would say, that darn drug strategy, they're just changing things and, and you know, we're changing things in our community. And so, Michael, I had kind of forgotten that you had been part of that, but Ken was so supportive in those early years. And, and I think that him and I had some great conversations over the work that we do in the community uh, when I served as the chair of that. I, uh, I knew Ken and Jean more on a personal level than, than um, in, in his public office, and what a wonderful family. When I think about the people who are really investing in the community, um, those are the people that I think of, and so I'm just grateful that Ken, Ken was part of Lloydminster and that we can, um, that we have so much to be grateful for in our community today because of the work that he's done. Thank you. Thanks, Councilor. Councilor Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, yeah, along with everybody here on Council, you know, I, I can agree with everything that was said here. He was, uh, he was a rock when it came to um, his experience and his uh, knowledge of the city, because of all his years of experience in, in, in Lloydminster and on council in whatever capacity. And I had the benefit of sitting uh, for a few years with him on council. And, you know, and one of the best parts was that we could disagree, but then once we walked out the door, we could just chat up. Uh, everything was good, and back to the same old, same old. And, and uh, that, was a, that was a great, great memory. Um, and yet, same thing, you know, when you go around, whether it was Alberta or Saskatchewan to those uh, conferences, it was, he was known. He was known around, and his name would be, would be across paths. Oh, it's Ken Baker. Did I hear Ken Baker was back then? Did I hear Ken Baker's on council? Is he still there? And, yep, yes, 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 he is. And, and uh, well known and uh, well liked in that uh, municipal world. So I, uh, I, I was very shocked and sad to hear that we wouldn't have his expertise outside of council here for this term, but uh, I look forward to what he might for all of us here today. Thank you, Council. I'd like to look to the executive team and see the manager and the We have dinner, well, we all have interactions with each other, and if there's any, any comments on it, feel like some of the things that you've got to see. Yeah, I think on behalf of administration, there's always a uh, well, uh, well-rounded respect for Councilor Baker and, and my term, Councilor Baker, and, and his 
in previous time as a mayor as well. And I know Ken back on a personal level with uh, growing up with his, uh, his daughter and, and family and uh, very well respected that way. Uh, we definitely knew where we stood with Councilor Baker. He always shot from the hip, which is sometimes, uh, you know, as you don't always like to hear that, but we, we knew where we stood and, and uh, I think we respected that from, from Councilor Baker and he always told you what, uh, um, how we felt and we also got a, a very good uh, uh, snapshot of what happened in the past in terms of how maybe a decision came to, came to the way it was uh, being presented for that day and how it might have been done a few years ago and compared to how it's done today. So we respected that and, and really appreciated the work that he did for the city and, and always support the support he gave administration and uh, uh, similar to what Councilor Whiting said, no matter if he could agree or disagree and, and uh, walk out of here and there, he could, you know, like nothing ever happened. So we definitely appreciate that. He'll definitely be missed on the mission. Thanks, Manager. With that, I will look for inquiries for the media. Thank you, Your Worship. Today we have interview requests for, uh, sorry, Councillor Buckingham, Councillor Marin, and yourself, Mayor Ellis. Thank you, Mayor. Look, Council for a motion to recess. Motion to recess. Motion to recess. Second by Councillor Buckingham. All in favor? Vote. Sure. We have a camera? We have a camera.